Mom's on fire. Guess I'm a bad liar. Hello, everyone, and welcome to probably the most unique review I'll ever give. Today's book is The Woman Who Wasn't There by Robin Gabby Fisher and a documentarian named Angelo J. Guglielmo Jr. This does have a documentary counterpart, which I did watch because this book is probably the worst I've ever read while simultaneously being one of the most fascinating stories. What I mean by that is, here's the huge spoiler, it centers around a woman named Gabby Head who became the most infamous 9-11 survivor when it turns out she was never actually in the Twin Towers when 9-11 occurred. I mean, baffling. It's super interesting. She fooled people for years and she was never actually there. My problem is that the book, like when I first opened it, I was very uh, pleased to see that it's not gonna be that long, but it took me like two weeks because it was so terribly written. And that is when I decided, hey, uh, let me watch the documentary to see if the documentary is any better. In the end, I kind of needed both. I understood facets of the documentary that I wouldn't have understood if I hadn't had all the back filler. I skipped so much of this book because there was no actual plot. There's no real point to it. The point was, yes, let's reveal this woman's deception but there was no structure to this novel. It was like, let's open up with her 9-11 story and then we're gonna transition into how she got involved with the World Trade Center Survivors Network and how she became the president and then how she began to gaslight people within the organization into her downward spiral and then the truth. The documentary it was only about an hour long and thankfully I did not succumb to the temptation to actually buy it because if I'd bought it, it would have been a waste of my money. Thankfully, I was able to find it um, by Googling it. The documentary, it lacked a lot of the background, a lot of the foundation that all this filler provided. Like it really let us know who these people were that were involved in this story and it, it fleshed her out a little bit more. I read somebody else's review and what was really missing from this and basically from the documentary as well is she definitely had some psychological issues because she was living in a fairyland. Like it was an entirely made up story, but she was 100% convinced of its truth. And what this novel needed and what the documentary needed were experts giving their opinions as to how she was able to convince herself so thoroughly that she was at the towers. But while reading this, it's so obvious that the story doesn't add up and that there's something wrong with her. Like her mood swings were so erratic. Why did nobody question what was going on with her? And then in that, like we just had no factual basis. All we had was the word of the people, which I don't mind. Like I, I had two different highlighter colors when I read it. The first was honestly the terrible writing when we are in her escape story. The construction of her story, it was very juvenile. Like it was by somebody who did not know how to put a novel together. We got a lot of backstory and it wasn't well crafted. And then my next highlighter color was all of the facts that were actually given. And so what I thought was most successful is the exposure to which, uh, or to the plight of the Twin Tower survivors. Because I, I never really noticed, but the stories that we get or all the nonfiction books that I have on my shelf are from the widows, are from the people who are connected to those that died. We hear about the people who escaped and we're like, wow, we're so happy you survived, but they were kind of second class citizens when it came to the memorial and all this stuff that would go on um, in commemoration of the um, the anniversary, they weren't allowed in. Like it was 
invite only and they were not invited. You, you just think how in the world could people who were bloodied and burned and severely injured, how come they were not recognized the same way as the family members of the fallen? They experienced it too. And in some ways it was, it, in my opinion, worse because they then had to live with it. The people who died, died. And of course their loved ones had to live with that, but they didn't have to live with the memories of being in the tower. They didn't have to live with the, the PTSD. And then they didn't have to live with not being acknowledged as part of this entire event. It's almost like you survived, that's enough. So I thought that was a really interesting aspect. And, and for me, who's always looking for information and insight, I thought it was pretty, pretty important and pretty cool. But anyways, Tanya Head, who her name is actually Alicia Estevez Head. She's from Barcelona. We learn this at the very beginning and then we get even more at the very end. So just the construction of this novel. I understand that we're trying to leave it as a huge surprise, but honestly, it, I, this was something I actually had no clue about, but my mom knew about it when I told her what book I was reading. So if you are of a certain age during 9-11 and you were paying attention to the news, even in the years afterwards, you knew about this woman's story. So unless you're ignorant like me, you had, it was a surprise. She had this fascination with America. Uh, she came from a wealthy family. And then according to her story, her name is Tanya Head. She had been engaged slash married to this guy named Dave. And can I say, I do not understand why they had to black out his last name. I, I felt like that was completely unnecessary because she herself in her entirety of, of her storyline, like in real life, never disclosed his last name. So why we had to disclose it, but like, black it out. I don't understand the, the choice there, but this guy named Dave, she claimed to work for Merrill Lynch, which is a financial company. Her home base was in San Francisco. Some At some point she had a meeting in New York. She ran into him because they were both trying to get the same taxi. He says, hey, I'll let you have the taxi if you give me a call and we have a date. She doesn't do it. Then some other time she comes back, they run into each other and then they have this amazing connection. And then we move into the fact that they want to get married and they're trying to plan this wedding. She's arguing with her future mother-in-law because she doesn't like the direction her mother-in-law is trying to take it, which I'm gonna get into that in a second. Only for Dave to surprise her with a trip to Hawaii where they got Maui'd, not married, but Maui'd. So I guess it wasn't an official wedding but to them, it instituted their marriage. They were still gonna have their big wedding, but yes, they got married. And then 9-11 happens. He was in the North Tower, she was in the South Tower. She's seeing this and she's like, oh my gosh, I hope he's okay. There had been a bombing in 1993. It was done by the same people, although at this point, nobody is putting that together. But because of that event, her tower, everybody's saying, hey, it's okay, stay where you are. Of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. but her immediate reaction was, I'm getting out of here. So she tells her coworkers, hey, come with me, we gotta get out of here. And she's up on the 78th, 79th floor, which is around where the, ta the plane hit. At least her secretary comes with her. So they're waiting and, and you know, the towers are a hundred odd floors high. And so they had different kinds of elevators and one was the express elevator, which it got you up to the top real quick. It had a couple stops. And so she's at the floor waiting for the express, express elevator. There's a whole bunch of other people there. Then the plane comes in, which at this moment, this is when I have some issues with the storytelling because I don't doubt that some people thought it was a plane. I don't doubt that word had gotten out, but it's all speculation at this point as to what had hit the other tower. And while they did have cell phones, they're just not the same as what we have now. And information wasn't as accessible as it is now. Nobody saw the first, first plane hit. Like it was not televised the way that the second one was. And so why at this moment, 
someone says, oh, it's another plane. I'm like, how did you know there was a first plane? I'll give it some grace because it's quite possible somebody had figured this out at this point. I don't know. The writing was just not up to par. The plane hits, the whole place goes up in flames, people are dying. She herself, her arm is severed. Her secretary that came with her is decapitated. She is on fire, she's burning alive. Only for this guy in the red bandana, who's a factual person who saved many lives, comes and rescues her. He He's looking for the people who's still alive. He finds her on their way out. She stumbles across this man who is dying and he's like, please take my wedding ring and tell my wife that I love her. She puts it in her pocket along with her severed arm or like nearly severed arm, which I could not, I mean, I'm guessing because in real life, something had happened to her arm. The explanation given is given in such a manner that it provides a lot of doubt. So I'm, I'm assuming it's like at the elbow because that's where her scars are because she was in the documentary. You see the scars on her arm. So I'm assuming she's like tucks it in her pocket. It's useless, but you know, it's just there. So at least I guess it won't tear all the way. I don't know. The book was really bad at explaining things, but he is like, here's a way out. Then he continues on. She goes down the stairs and I'm just saying guys, it takes hours to get down these stairs, especially when you run into hundreds, if not thousands like of others who are also trying to escape. So while like, two odd thousand died on 9-11, there are tens of thousands who could have been in the towers. I don't know exactly how many escaped. I don't really know how many people she encountered like when she finally hit the roadblock, but it, it was actually a very impactful story as poorly written as it was because you got this sense of the urgency and the horror that she encountered. It turns out that, here's a spoiler, she'd been in Barcelona at school when the event happened. So this very, very, very rich imaginary life came from research. She really just had this year to read other people's stories. You can see how she cherry picked pieces from other people's stories that she somehow got on the internet, which sideline here, they barely had Google. I don't even know if we had Google at that time. I think we had Ask Jeeves, which was really unreliable. So the internet was not the source of information that it is now. We did not have Wikipedia. So I don't actually know how she got her information unless somehow she got access to newspapers. Her whole story unraveled because reporters, or at least one reporter in particular for the New York Times, was trying to get information on her because he wanted to write a story for an anniversary and as the most infamous survivor, he was like, how did I never hear of her? She is who she says she is. Like we should highlight her. All the facts she gave about her workplace and her background and her engagement slash marriage today, like nothing lined up. How did he not, and this is five years on, how could he not just look all this stuff up? I understood like you should go to the source, but why did nobody look anything up of her? Mm, I know it's actually based off true events, but still like, mm, like it's so suspicious to me. And I know I get the privilege of hindsight is 2020, but did none of these people compare stories or like they were all so in awe of her, you know, they must've been talking about her because they thought she was so amazing. Did they never say, wow, our stories like don't line up from what she's told us. And then with his parents, with Dave's parents, she goes to a ceremony for him and she hangs out with his parents. And this is all third person. Like we are getting this information 
from somebody else's perspective. Maybe except that it's such this, a big deal and there are probably all kinds of strangers coming because he knew people that his parents didn't know. But you would think that the mother would be like, who are you? That there would be some indication they do not have a relationship except that she seems to be very charismatic. She's very good at meeting people and befriending people and just schmoozing. So maybe she just did a very good job since we don't have her first person account. Like we don't know how the mother reacted. We then, and, and this is when the writing was also really odd. First person narrating him, all right? It is her story. And then it almost pulls back. And this is also why I wanted to watch the documentary. I wanted to see how they portrayed this entire story. It was basically just a narrator depicting all the stories with snippets of people talking. Why couldn't they have done this here? Why did we have to start with her story in this way? I had no clue. Like we head hopped like nobody's business. And we meet all these people who were involved, all the ways that they were gaslighted, how she, even though she wasn't actually a survivor, but by the end of this book, she still acts like she's the one who was wronged. Like how in the world could nobody believe me? We see how she finds this online support group for 9-11 survivors because they're like, we are treated like second class citizens. We need people to talk to and how she grows it into something that is a nationwide organization and how she gets their recognition and how she advocates for their rights and, and their voice. And, and then we start getting other people's stories and perspectives, their interactions with her. It could have been okay, but it wasn't because the story, this book was so poorly written. This one girl, woman, especially Linda, this is not something that's included in documentary and I thought it was especially powerful. She admits she's a people pleaser. She doesn't have much self-esteem and, and I don't really understand her perspective because she wasn't necessarily a survivor of the Twin Towers, but she was a witness. And so I guess somehow just being a witness to this was traumatic for her. She feels like an imposter when she first goes to one of these meetings because she doesn't feel like she deserves to be there because her story is not the same as theirs, but at the same time, she was affected by it. So she feels like she should be there because she needs a way to heal, which I think is completely valid. I just felt like we'd gotten, we needed to get more into her head and into her story because it's a valid perspective, but I don't feel like it was fleshed out well enough to make me say, Yes, you belong there. Not saying she doesn't, but as per the storytelling, it wasn't done correctly. Anywho, she becomes enamored with Tanya and she somehow ingratiates herself into Tanya's circle. They become besties, but then Tanya is so verbally and emotionally and mentally abusive to Linda and Linda just lets it happen. I was astonished like i get it you're a people pleaser but this woman is abusing you and you just put up with it and then we have a couple of perspectives from psychologists in my opinion and a little bit to what they admit is they cross the boundaries between professional and personal they just let her have her way and treat people the way that she wants to treat people and they're always gonna side with her and they never take a step back and say, something's wrong here. Like this one guy came up with this therapy called flooding. Other psychologists have, or psychotherapists, I don't know, they're all the same to me, but others have worked with like PTSD by constantly exposing their patients. It is controversial, but like making their patients kind of desensitized to the event so that they can see that it's not gonna come after them. And he takes it one step further. He has her record her story and then she has to relive it over and over and over. She says to him, I just don't think I can do it here. I need to do it at home. And he's like, 
okay, why don't you get a close family or friend to do this with you? So she calls up Linda and Linda's like, I can't do this. This is re-traumatizing me. She goes to her therapist and then Tanya insists on coming with her. Thankfully, her therapist is like, no, you're not allowed to sit in on our session because you're not allowed to sit in our session. And in the session, Linda reveals to her what Tanya's doing and how it's affecting her. And she's like, you're not qualified. So it's like, thank the Lord. Finally, someone says, this is inappropriate. Like regarding Tanya, this is inappropriate behavior. And, and this empowers Linda to say, hey, I can't do this. And then Tanya gets all upset with her. And I'm just like, these behaviors, she becomes so erratic. Why is nobody, like they're all saying, oh yeah, you're like Tanya was calling us at all hours of the night. We used to just drop everything to listen to her, but now it's getting to be too much. And she's not answering phone calls. She's not answering her door. She's not coming to events that she's supposed to come to. And all throughout this narrative, like she had befriended survivors of the Ho Oklahoma City bombing. They would come visit her, but she would never follow through to visit them. And then she would invite them to her vacation house. And then she would cancel on them when they've already booked their tickets. Like she was so unreliable. Because we're not getting a medical point of view, I can't say whether or not this is acceptable behavior. If this is normal behavior for somebody who went through such a traumatic event. Oh my gosh, this woman really believes what she's saying. So where are the experts to chime in on how she really could be so deluded? Because in the end we learn it's all a lie. So I needed the experts to, to chime in here and give us insight into how she really could believe what she's saying. And when it all comes to light, her mother, because then the documentarian goes to Spain to try to talk to people about her, her mother has everybody ghost him. And I'm like, or if they did talk to him, they were like, please do not mention our names or our faces. And I'm like, but her mother knows this is all a farce. So why is her mother backing her up? And then her friends from the Oklahoma City bombing, they never, they never turn their backs on her. And she's like, these are true friends. And I'm like, what's going on there? I now want their perspective as to why they stuck by her when all these people who are in her inner circle, her immediate inner circle are like, we feel so betrayed. Like we cannot believe she would do this to us. The whole thing with this documentary, first off, I was very confused because she doesn't like talking. Okay, she'll talk to the press if it's not about herself, if it is about the organization, but she does not like talking about her own experience, even though she tells everybody and their mother. In regards to this documentary, she's the one who asked the documentarian to do it, even though she does not want to be featured. She does not want her story out there. He does convince her to be part of it. And then obviously she starts putting up roadblocks later on. But when everything comes to light and he is able to have a one-on-one -on -one with her, she's literally schizophrenic. Like this woman is in her own her own world. And he speaks with her, she makes sure he's not recording, but then in the end she says, well now you have an end to the documentary. You just have to read it to know how off the wall this comment is regarding her really erratic behavior during their conversation. Then she emails him and she says, are you actually gonna go through with it? And he's like, well, yeah, because everybody else wants it. She's now been kicked out of the organization. She's not a part of it. She's ghosting everybody, but she's like, are you actually gonna follow through with it? And he's like, well, yeah, because the, they took a vote. They still want it done, but I'm gonna honor you. And I was just like, this whole thing took a huge turn. Why are we still trying to honor her when she's a fraud? I know what he's trying to say is he doesn't want to paint her in a bad light because she did do so much for the um, the World Trade Center Survivors Network. But I feel like, okay, include her story, include what she did, 
but also you need to be honest about what she who she was and what she did and how she tricked everybody it it, it was an astonishing story terrible book not a bad documentary but i feel like if you only watch the documentary you are missing out on so much because it doesn't really dive into what she did like to the extent of how she treated people and how she blackballed them and how she manipulated them it was amazing i think what's even more amazing is that she 100 percent disappeared nobody knows what happened to her apparently there was a rumor that she had committed suicide which was untrue the end is the documentarian goes to spain to try to get information on her and the one person who would talk to him was a childhood friend of Tanya's. And she's like, her name's not even Tanya. Her name is Alicia. Yes, she came from this very high profile family. She's very wealthy. Growing up, she did have a very rich imagination. When we started to get into our adolescence, she would lie about her her romantic experiences and the relationships that she was in, but everybody would just kind of laugh it off because that's just Tanya. We know it's not true. Then the older we got, then the more cruelty she experienced because she was overweight and because she lived in this fairyland. The turning point was she goes off to, to high school or to college and she's in this car accident. The family story, and this is where I'm just like, I don't know what to believe here, is that she was thrown out of the car and discovered cradling her severed arm. So this is the arm that she claims was damaged in the Twin Towers. And then it's one, of the, one of the guys is like, you know, and he, he doesn't say it in the book. He says it in the documentary. He's like, you know, I always, or uh, there, there was a moment where I looked at her arm and I said, that looks more like grafted and not necessarily being burned. All these people were so under her spell that they just couldn't see the forest through the trees. I, I really wanted to delve more into that because it's fascinating that they would see inaccuracies with her or they would see manipulations with her but they still went along with her i think it's that same guy who he started everything they were co-chairs we are only theorizing here he said something that she got threatened by because he saw a nugget of truth and he brought it up to her from that point on she then starts getting in other people's ears saying how he's unreliable and he isn't good for the organization anymore and she gets him kicked out and then she becomes president which they would never had that role before so she has this monopoly over this entire group she also blacklisted a gentleman because she was liberal she would post her own liberal thoughts but then he posts his conservative thoughts and she has him kicked out because he is posting things that are against their rules. And then this other woman, there had been like this walk. Tanya had been wearing a shirt with Dave's face on it. And this woman who also worked for his company, just a different branch, she was like, I didn't know that you knew Dave, that your Dave and our Dave was the same Dave. She gets kicked out too. Like it's amazing the things that Tanya was able to accomplish. We should dove into that. Like that is incredibly fascinating we get to the the friend in barcelona and we we hear about how she had gotten into this accident and how after this accident is when she 100 percent started to live in a fairy tale land that was something we should have gotten into we should have explored what would have caused that? We learned that her, her dad and her brother were sent to jail for a Ponzi scheme. This caused a dissolution within the family. So she and her mother, I guess, relocated to the States and are living in San Francisco. And I'm just like, if her family was ruined, where did all of her money come from? Because she wasn't working for Merrill Lynch. She had no job. It was amazing and terrible at the exact same time when the deception was uncovered which it was uncovered because this journalist basically was like hey i want to do a story on you and she rejected it she was not going to be part of it she was complaining 
to her friends about how he was stalking her, how he would not leave her alone, how mean he was. And then when he started reaching out to them, they were like, you need to leave us alone. You need to leave her alone. Only for, this is the weirdest part. I just, I don't really understand this. It was a little better explained in the documentary, but she goes to a lawyer. She brings a friend with her. She, the mother, go to meet with this lawyer. And I guess it's really to get this guy off her back. But that's not explained here. I'm like, why is she going to a lawyer? How will this help with the situation? In the documentary, it's explained that somebody suggests she get a lawyer involved. That makes sense. Not this go to a lawyer, but get a lawyer involved. Her friend is sitting outside for about two hours. Tanya and her mom come out and the lawyer, and this is why I don't understand either. It's supposed to be confidential, right? They're coming out and he's like, you know, it's okay that you weren't actually there, that you were visiting. It's okay that you didn't actually work for Merrill Lynch. What in the world? She then goes to all the others and she's like, look, everything she said is a lie. And so that is when they get in touch with the reporter and, and the whole thing comes out. But now Tanya is incensed. I can understand their hurt and their unwillingness to want to believe that she is anything but what she says she is because she brought them together. She unified them. She got them rights. She got their voices heard. And for her to be a liar would mean that this emotional support that she created for them was false. And that's when I needed the experts. I needed their voices. I needed their opinions, their thoughts to, to back up all of this or to explain all of this. Yeah, we just don't have it. I don't necessarily recommend the book. If anything, I would say watch the documentary because you get the gist. You just don't get as much depth as you would from the book, but the book was, it was just so poorly constructed. That's all I can say. The, there were a myriad of issues. That is the woman who wasn't there. I'm still astounded that she got away with this lie for six years. She was so high profile within the 9-11 community and nobody questioned her. Nobody checked into her background. They just said, okay. I mean, there's just so many holes there that, but she was so charismatic, very much like a Jim Jones. And she just could get people to follow her and believe her and love her and do whatever she wanted them to do without questioning it. I will see you next week and have a great day. Bye.